It is Paramedic Services Week in the province, but how much do we really know about what paramedics do in the community? Our Michelle Molusky obtained an inside look by getting exclusive unrestricted access to Essex Windsor EMS. And Michelle, you're joining us now with a, a special series. Yes, absolutely, Jim. I'm so excited about this. This is an idea I first mentioned of doing a ride along with paramedics to Essex Windsor EMS chief about two years ago. It took that long to get all the logistics and details figured out. So just a few weeks ago, I spent two overnight shifts with two paramedics. The cliche is true. It was all worth the wait and appropriate because I realized very quickly in my ride along that medics have to wait and be ready for anything and then jump into action without hesitation. It's an unpredictable profession. The patient had no loss of consciousness. So. Never knowing what's coming next. Deep breath. Some damages on the frontal aspect. Good. Meet paramedic Krista Hillier. Let them know it's unfortunate, but we're here to help you. I love that. And her colleague, Nick Monteleone. You never know, a second by second, it'll change. This team of paramedics let us tag along for two 12-hour shifts. Monteleone has been a paramedic for six years. Hillier for 10. Ten four ten eight. It doesn't take so long to get busy. And... <laughs> this call a diabetic having chest pains. Can you roll just a little bit? Sorry, we're gonna kind of come from you from all angles. That's from good. Her. That's good. You're right good. There. So that'll probably make you quite tired in about 15 minutes, okay? The patient is brought to Olet campus. Monteleone handles the transfer while Hillier gets ready for the next run. Because we don't know what's wrong with the patient, when infections or diseases or anything, uh, we have to clean everything. No sooner does 1119 go back into service. Dispatch is asking everyone their 1020, which is their location. And a new call. A child in Bell River is having difficulty breathing. The problem is this. They're going to have to go towards a turning lane to get through the, the accident. There's a multi-car accident at E.C. Row and Banwell. Monteleone must maneuver through the backed up traffic and safely get around the crash scene while still trying to get to their call as fast as possible. I was going through my protocols in my mind of what I need to do, what needs to be done. No sooner do we drive through it. 1119, did you copy your cancel? 1119, 10 4. The Bell River call is cancelled. Even though the paramedics know they could help at this accident, they must listen to dispatch and drive away. But only for a moment. Dispatch asks them to respond to transport a patient. It gets erased when the call gets, you know, got cancelled, and then we're on to a different style of a call where I'm thinking of now trauma assessment. He okay. was extricated and brought over here by, where, by passengers. What part in the van? Driver, passenger? Well, I'm going to assume the passenger. Okay. The crew picks up their patient who doesn't appear to be critically injured, but there's a bigger problem. Did you speak any English at all? No. No English? Okay. Does that hurt? No. Up here? Down here? Oh, oh sorry. Oh, yeah, down here. When you can tell someone's in distress and you can't communicate with them, you know, your adrenaline's going too, right? Because you know you have to assess this patient appropriately, administer medications potentially, but you don't really know what their history is. We arrive at Olette campus, but because the man's injuries aren't critical, he'll have to wait to be transferred. This is called a code 7, or offload delay. Which means there's no beds in the hospital. So the crew must wait. One paramedic will wait inside with the patient, while Monteleone takes advantage of the brief downtime. We eat whenever we can and get our lunch in on the few minutes that we can. Waiting for the call is also a part of being a paramedic and jumping into action as soon as the next call comes in. You use your time driving to the calls to kind of prepare mentally. Help them in a time of need and kind of be the one that they have to lean on. All of that in that one story is just a small handful of calls we took in my time with Hillier and Monteleone. Over the two shifts, I was surprised at the wide range of calls paramedics respond to in any given shift. Everything from patients struggling with their mental health to people who were just having a little bit too much fun downtown. Now tomorrow I'm going to show you just how diverse Jim a paramedic skill set has to be. Just in one shift, the wide range of calls and every time they have to reset, 
and start over again. Absolutely incredible. What an experience. One of the most incredible things I have ever done in this job. I ever. love the way your camera looked in. It was not obtrusive, but you, you got some uh, m quiet moments there. Yeah. Uh, it, they and they were so great and so generous with their time and they just they talked to me about everything that they were doing the two paramedics were absolutely amazing i can't wait for the next two stories. good we'll look forward to it michelle yeah. molesky tonight thank you michelle well imagine what it must feel like to restore a failing person's heartbeat to get them breathing again an awesome gift not to mention an awesome responsibility but one that skilled paramedics are faced with each day tonight we continue our exclusive look behind the scenes with Essex Windsor EMS and here to join us Michelle Molesky well Jim as you know paramedics are the first line of emergency personnel frankly I wanted to do this ride along because we so rarely see medics in actions they're first on scene and first to leave rushing patients to the hospital all of the medics I talk to take a tremendous amount of pride in being able to quickly adapt from one situation to the next even if it means never finding out how their patient's story ends. It's a game of ping pong. Just because you're told you're going for a chest pain call, you could walk into the house and the person could be totally different. Paramedics Krista Hillier and Nick Monteleone have seen a lot, and yet they both say they'll never tire of this job. And then I'm just gonna give you some oxygen here, okay, honey? because each call is a challenge. In our 24 hours with them, the calls were varied. One call involved a man who Hillier has helped before, but who won't answer their questions. The man has blood on his face and pants. Can I just do a quick search on you? I have to do it for security reasons, okay? Do you have any weapons or anything sharp on you? No. Another call, a woman with high blood pressure, but the medics can't convince her to go to the hospital. You could have a stroke or a heart attack or even death, okay? Do you understand that? If you don't want to go, you have to sign a form saying that we were here, you're refusing, we've explained everything to you. Then there's a man who requires palliative care, but more than what's provided at home. Why did the catheter go in the first time? Was he, was he retaining urine? Was he not peeing? And yet another call, this time a woman who is having too much of a good time. So what's the story? She was just found outside? Yeah, sounds like she was doing shots of tequila. Each patient requires a different kind of medical help and each case in a different kind of environment. Some calls are outside in the fresh air. Okay, what happened? Did you hit by a car? Okay. Did you... It's okay, listen, we're just trying to make sure that you're okay. Others in dimly lit bedrooms. What have your readings been in the past I couple of days? I don't do it all the time because I can't afford that hundred dollars. Right. Okay. On this call, a diabetic patient's sugar is high, dangerously so. The medics prepare to bring the woman to hospital, but watch as Monteleone is forced to use a flashlight balanced under his chin to put an IV needle in. Nice and relaxed. Okay. Then, when it's time to get the elderly woman outside, the halls in her home are too narrow for the stretcher and the wheelchair. In through oh, that nose. Careful. Yeah, yeah. Hillier and Monteleone must carry the woman outside. Watch your step. Well, don't even worry about us. <laughs> yeah, but he goes down, I go down. No, oh, no, don't you worry about that. <laughs> but listen. I don't go down. The nice thing is, is you fall on him. <coughs> I'll, I'll be your cushion, I promise. Mm. You're good, my way. But there was one call in particular during our time with paramedics that stands out. A male patient having a heart attack. The call says he has no vital signs. 1119 responds even though two other ambulances are already here. So no shocks delivered at all, right? No, it's been assistance yeah. raised. No calls. Start CPR. He originally didn't even have a rhythm to shock. Uh, so they just basically pushed drugs and continued with the CPR the whole time. We were lucky to have so many hands on that, on that call. With the help of up to 10 paramedics and a crew of Windsor firefighters, the patient is taken out of his home and over his steep front porch. Okay, let's do an analysis, guys. You gave that up in the last one? Okay. Check for pulse. No pulse. Continue CPR. I'm just gonna do my patch now. Yep. We got some sort of something. Check. Check. Second bike car was going in. We arrive at Met Hospital and once here, a glimmer of hope. He now has a pulse and is breathing on his own. And it's super exciting, you know, because we're we're one step closer. We're doing better than we were. The patient is strong enough to be taken to Olet campus because it's the base hospital for cardiac care. Any 
paramedic that's been around knows that that you're not in the clear you know that that quickly deteriorates back to a cardiac arrest state we know the realities of it we hope for the best but as soon as he's rushed into Olette, the story ends for paramedics that's it the call's done we have no idea what happens from there majority of the times we have no idea what the outcome is if they you know if they improve if they don't i mean it's it that's a little frustrating you know on, on the job you think about it a lot you wonder there isn't even a lot of time for that because in a moment there's someone else who needs their help. Now, in the case of the man with no vital signs, the medics don't know what happened to their patient. His privacy rights don't allow them to find out what his story ended up as. Monteleone and Hillier say opinion varies within EMS about whether or not they should be able to know about outcomes. Some medics, they say, would love to know the results, whether or not to know the actions that they take in the ambulance have any effect long term. Others prefer to believe they did the very best they could, and finding out the end of the story wouldn't change what they do on each call. So tomorrow in my last exclusive look at our local paramedics, I want to show you a few things I learned that might be useful to you as a driver on the road, for instance. Jim, I was amazed at what the paramedics have to do all at the same time. It's the ultimate in multitasking. So that will be the wrap up tomorrow night. You touched on uncooperative patients. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought of that, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, being uh, right next door to a major hospital, uh, it, it's often that you see a police car following the paramedics into the hospital, isn't it? And, and you know, that does happen quite often. And in some of the cases, you know, that the, I felt, you know, very bad for the paramedics because they really wanted to take these people to the hospital just to be checked over, but they would not go. And they had to walk away. And I think they had a hard time with that because it's hard to walk away from someone. So. Most interesting. Michelle, thank you. Yep. See you tomorrow. Well, we have an update tonight to our exclusive inside look this week at Essex Windsor EMS. Now, last evening at 6, we told you that Paramedics rarely, if ever, find out how their patient's health care story ends. After that story aired, the family of a man who at one point didn't have a pulse, whom paramedics resuscitated, he contacted our newsroom. And Michelle Molusky joins us now. Well, Jim, sadly, uh, as we told you about the story last night, the man uh, paramedics brought back did in fact, unfortunately, pass away a few days later. His family says doctors had declared him brain dead. But something positive came from this tragedy. Because paramedics got a pulse back, the family was able to donate the man's heart, lungs, and liver. They tell me they're grateful to EMS for keeping him alive long enough to save the lives of three other people. Krista Hillier is overwhelmed by this news and she says she would always like to hear from families, good or bad, because she says it helps her learn and this kind of outcome helps them push through the tougher calls. But that's not the only thing they want you to know about the job of paramedic. We see them every day. Ambulances racing through town. He's experiencing some palpitations and some epigastric pain. But you may not know just how much multitasking it takes for EMS to provide acute care. Paramedics like Krista Hillier have to do at least five things at once. Drive, relay information to the hospital, watch for oncoming traffic, and run the sirens. It'll go from like one tone to a next tone, and then there's also like uh, the air horn that you go through an intersection. You're good my way so that people can hear it because sometimes if it's the same tone and someone's blasting their music, they don't pay attention to it. All the while paying attention to what's happening with the patient in the back. So I can go or, or well, yeah. drive to Campbell to Curry? Yeah. Okay. And then there's getting to a call in the first place. We have to guide ourselves to the call. So you have to know your area. And you do learn uh, the city quite well working. But their biggest stress is other drivers. That was close. Yep. Going to the right is a death trap. If you stick to the left, generally speaking, you're always going to be safe because you can evade a car or a car will see you a lot. Sometimes there's a lot of information to relay, so paramedics like Nick Monteleone use a form of shorthand. Every region has kind of their special lingo, lingo or abbreviations, if you will. Coming to you, see task three. We have a 24-year-old female, extremely HBD. What is HBD again? Uh, has been drinking. Olet Campus of Windsor Regional has shorthand too. 1119 arrived VOC. A code three is for a call that isn't serious, so no lights, no sirens, no speeding. The opposite is a code four. 
And even though it may seem like they're driving fast, paramedics are only allowed to go 20 kilometers over the speed limit. Being a paramedic has also gone high tech. They have hydraulic stretchers, GPS positioning for each vehicle to make sure no one area of the city or county is without coverage, and Bluetooth technology. Everything that happened on that call is recorded in our defibrillator. To speed up the paperwork process. Yes, 142. Each call requires about 20 minutes of paperwork. Before the ambulance is cleared to move on. I remember you. I've been here before. How are you? There are a few things you can do to help paramedics. The biggest is probably the easiest. Metformin or Glyburide or... I have no idea what okay. they do. Do you have one of these on your fridge? It's called a Kool-Aid form. It has all their medical history here that we would ask a patient, and if there's a language barrier or they're unable to communicate with us, it'll list it right here. If you have any pets, best to move them away from where the paramedics need to work. So what's going to happen is the dog is going to think that you're attacking their owner. Unfortunately, the dog doesn't know who we are and we're in uniform. It's scary to them and we're touching and manipulating their owner. It's going to be a little chill. So no allergies, are you okay? schizophrenia, and yeah. MI. Yep. Okay. 280 yeah. paramedics work for Essex-Windsor EMS. I love it because I get to be involved in something different every day, but mainly the people that I get to meet. You can rely on each one of them to help you. You okay to step on our, uh, onto our stretcher? Uh, yeah. Okay, you, you you're more comfortable being in the back of the ambulance? Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's do that. I understand. Whatever the circumstances. Paramedic Services Week continues tomorrow with another survivor story. Deputy Chief Justin Lammer says they'll be reuniting a LaSalle man with the paramedics who saved him from a heart attack. That's tomorrow at noon, happening on our sister station, AM800, with arms on the noon report. I want to thank everyone at Essex-Windsor EMS, specifically Chief Bruce Crowder, his deputies Justin Lammers, Chris Grant and Ryan LeMay, and District Chief Tyson Broman for helping me make all of this happen. But the biggest thanks goes to Krista Hillier and Nick Monteleone. They are incredible people whose honesty with me and passion for their work are things, Jim, I won't ever forget. They certainly gave you unlimited access, Michelle. There was they nothing really uh, did. that you were not allowed to show with no, the camera. No, there, there wasn't at all. All right, very well, Michelle, thank you. You're welcome.